watching WGOL Channel 7 News. I'm Melissa Sutton. And I'm Jose Delaine Belter. And today is Sunday, February 21st, 2021. Before that was Beef Smith or Gavin, that was Rufus Estes, the first African American celebrity chef. Born in 1837. Rufus Estes created the first book by an African American. It, it was entitled Good Things to Eat. So please check out Rufus Estes, our first black celebrity chef. This has been your moment in black history. Now for your week in review. On Monday, we'll have prayer and conversation with Pastor Banks at 7 p.m. via conference call. On Wednesday, we will have Battle study at 12.30 with Pastor Banks, at 6.30 with Brother Brian Mills, both via Facebook Live. And on Sunday, Sunday School at 9.15 with Dr. Cynthia Williams Brown via conference call. 11 a.m. will have service with Pastor Banks via Facebook Live. And the youth will have it at 11.15 via Zoom. Please cover yourselves accordingly to these announcements. Happy birthday to Amber Say. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Our days are happier when we give people a bit of our heart rather than a piece of our mind. This has been Mo's Motivational Moment.
should be in the land of the living. I've been dealing with sinus stuff all week, weekend, so pray for us. But God is an ever-present help in our time of trouble. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for the peace that you give to us in the midst of everything that goes on in life. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, all that you will do, all that is to come because we trust it in you. As we begin this season of Lent, preparing ourselves for the celebration of Resurrection Sunday morning, we pray, oh God, that you would move in our hearts so that well, we won't have religion, but we'll seek relationship. Following you is not a bunch of, about a bunch of rules and regulations that humans made. It's about seeking an intimate walk with thee. So come now, Holy Spirit, Heavenly God. Come into this place and give us your peace. In Jesus' name. Our scripture lesson for this morning is found in Luke 18. The 9 through 14 verses. Reading from the New International Version. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I give. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Continue to bless all those who are brokenhearted those who are bereaved, those who are depressed, those who are worried, those who are troubled. Let them know who you are. You've allowed this world to go into such a calamity for a reason. And I believe the reason is that we get away from religion, but we get away from a true walk with you. Religion is about our rules and regulations. And humans have made a whole lot of rules and regulations when it comes to dealing with you. But you don't have any, you don't have any rules and regulations except to love the Lord with all our heart, our mind, and our soul. And then lay for your neighbor as yourself. We've added a whole lot to it to fit our own fantasy. But maybe, Lord, this coronavirus is calling us to just seek you. Not seek rules and regulations, not seek our doctrine, but seek you. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Seek you. Lord, we make people good at church, but not good Christians. Time is now to become Christian. To be 
become like Christ. So Lord, I pray whatever we say or do today will help us get a little closer to being like Christ. Not like church members, but like Christ. Because the time is now. The time, we don't have any much time. Matter of fact, it's past time. The church must be the church. And that is those who seek after Christ. And are bringing others to seek after Christ. That's the mission of the church. And I pray God, that in the midst of this all, if we haven't learned anything during this coronavirus pandemic, is that we got to stop doing our thing and start doing God's thing. I pray that you would temper our hearts. Those of us who've been doing our own thing for so many years and we forgot what God's thing is, if we ever knew it. Help us, God, to seek you. Not our thoughts, not our what we want, you. That's the only thing that's going to help people through this, seeking you. So I pray that we'll seek you with all our heart, our mind, our soul. Everything we have, we're given unto thee. Lord, this is our prayer and our petition. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, Dolan. Listen, Lord, a prayer by James Wilton Johnson. Oh, Lord, we come this morning. Knee bowed and body feet. Before thy throne of grace, O oh Lord, this morning, bow our hearts beneath our knees, and our knees in some lonesome valley. We come this morning like empty pitchers to a full fountain, with no merits of our own, O oh Lord, open up the windows of heaven, and lean out over the battlements of glory, and listen this morning. Lord, have mercy on our proud and dying sinners, sinners hanging over the mouth of hell, who seem to love their distance well. Lord, ride by this morning, mount your milk white horse and ride up this morning. And in your ride, ride by oh hell. Ride by the digi gates of hell. And stop poor sinners in their headlong plume. And now, oh Lord, this man of God who breaks the bread of life this morning, shadow him in the hollow of your hand and keep him out of the gunshot of the devil. Take him, Lord, this morning. Wash him with his inside and out. Hang him up and drain him dry of sin. Pin his ear to the wisdom post and make his words stay hammers of truth. Beating on the iron heart of sin. Lord God, this morning, put his eye to the telescope of eternity and let him look upon the pile paper walls of time. Lord, turpentine his imagination, put perpetual motion in his arms, fill him with all of the dynamite of thy power, anoint him all over with the oil of thy salvation, and set his tongue on fire. And now, oh Lord, when I've done drunk my last cup of sorrow, when I've been called everything but a child of God, when I've done traveling up the rough side of the mountain, oh Mary's baby, when lower me to my dusty grave in peace, Amen. to wait for that great getting up moment. We are switching from a 
system that just sends out texts, the system that sends out texts and phone numbers. We're going to be sending you some information for you to opt in. You need to opt in. If there's someone that you know that's not on and we don't have their numbers, you all have to stop moving and switching numbers and not telling people. Because you can't get upset if you do that and then we don't contact you. If you switch a number, just like you call the doctor, call the church, or call somebody, tell them that you switch your number. I'm thankful for the legacy that we have been given. But oftentimes, I'm troubled by what we've done with the legacy. This being Black History Month, I don't know if many of you watched the PBS series with Henry Louis Gates about the black church. And it made me think about how we have squandered the legacy of those who had to endure what they had to endure. Amen. I was riding yesterday, uh, was it yesterday or Friday, I can't remember, but and I was thinking about slavery. And I was thinking about all that our ancestors have to endure, had to endure. Snatched from their homes, given into slavery by their own people who had no idea of the brutality of American chattel slavery. Right. How the folks that brought us here are mad today because they never imagined that we would be their equal nor would one of us ascend to be their president or vice president. We were not brought here to be equal, we were brought here to be slaves. And that's what the anger of some of these people because they live in a delusional, they live in, the, in a delusional thing that it was always going to be that way. What slavery was going in any way? The cotton was going to, the soil was going to become non-existent and Machinery was in, but machinery was coming in. But the issue becomes for us is that what have we done when we were when so much was given for us to get to this point? You know, I wonder how our ancestors would feel that they were raped, separated from their families, beaten, whipped. So, for us to come to 2021 and sit in the church and argue about the color of the pew. <laughs> what would our ancestors think when Herod Tubman and others had to risk their lives to get brothers and sisters over to Canada so they can survive for us to complain we stay in church too long. We have a resiliency that's part of being African American in this country. And somewhere in our maturation as a people, we've gotten some things mixed up. Because what got our ancestors through slavery was not a bunch of rules and regulations. What got them through slavery was the belief that one day, if it wasn't their children, it might be their grandchildren. If it wasn't their children, grandchildren, it might be their great-grandchildren. If it wasn't their great-grandchildren, it might be their great-great-great-grandchildren that one day they would live in this country and be free. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. believed that we would be free. We have even messed up his legacy. A lot of it's because of greed. Yeah. We want to be, we want to have, have it all. 
But I can tell you, you can't take it with you. There's a book called The Treasure Principle. You ought to read it. You ought to get it and read it. The Treasure Principle. It talks about you can't take it with you, but you can send it before you. This whole coronavirus thing, this whole isolation, what is it, God, that you want us to see through it all? I believe God is telling us that we must return to our first love. We got so many rules and regulations and religion, that's why we got 15 million denominations. But there's just one God. You know why we got denominations? Because somebody got mad at somebody else or somebody interpreted something a different way. But the issue is this. God has been God since God was God. <laughs> God had not changed. From everlasting to everlasting, God is God. And what got our ancestors through was the belief that this God would see them through. Now my question to you this morning, has God changed since they were singing Wade in the Water. <laughs> has God changed? No, God has not changed. We have changed. We've gotten too cute for God. We've gotten too sophisticated for God. Our intellect rules our, our thought process instead of the spirit which connects to the Holy Spirit. And in the midst of this new neo civil rights movement, and if you don't think we're in a new civil rights movement, you'd have lost your mind. Right. Because the QAnons and the, and, the, and the Proud Boys and all that group wants you to know that they don't want you here. But we're here. Right. And we're going to stay here. Right. Not by the power of the United States government, right. but by the grace of an almighty God. Amen. God deserves that we give God all of our attention. Yes. And stop playing church. Right. Stop playing with God. Now you hear people say playing church. You know what playing church is? Acting like you are a Christian when you're really not. All right. um, That's what playing is. It, it, you know, I, I, I'm not so excited that people jump up and down because when you jump up and down, when you get still, what you gonna do? Yeah. It's all right to shout as long as you got something, as long as you got something to shout about. And something you want to shout about is just not what God is doing for you because Jesus said, love your Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and love your neighbor as yourselves. What got black folk to this point was that we really trusted in God, but we got so cute that we forgot about God. What's the matter now, Zion? All right. What's the matter now? All right. We've got, we forgot about how God brought you through. And it's good to talk about where the Lord has brought you from, but you know what? Sometimes when you didn't have much, you trusted in God more than when you had a whole lot. That's right. When we had dirt floors in our churches, we trusted God a little bit more. Now we get a little carpet and get a little paint on the walls. We don't want nobody to do nothing in the church like this. And, and, and we treat the church like it's more important than God. Or we treat the church like it's more important. This is a building. It will fall one day. It's going to rock. It's just like you. It's going to back. You can't stay there. It's not eternal. But we got to trust it in the eternal and not in the temporal. Well, all of this is going to waste away. Build your hopes on things eternal. We got to stop building our hopes on temporal stuff. It won't last. And looking back at that series, the black church, what got us to this point is that we always believe that a better day is coming. Yes, yes, yes. But when we get to the better day, we can't forget the one who got us to the better day. Amen. I challenge every one of you as I challenge myself. Servant, put yourself in front of the great gospel mirror good story, the good news. And ask yourself, Lord, am I trusting you like I should trust you? Or am I more concerned about my rules? But that think about it. That's why we got first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist. Because somebody didn't like what somebody else did, so they changed the rules. 
So we make church about rules instead of God. You, you know that's why Jesus had problems. That's why the Pharisees had problems with Jesus. Because he didn't follow the rules. <laughs> that's why they had problems with him. I'm going to say this and I'm going to get on to my little message here. But you remember when he was eating, when they were eating, and they didn't wash their hands, and the, and the, and the Jews had all these elaborate rituals which you're supposed to wash your hands and do all this ceremony and wash it. And they said, Rabbi, man, come here, look at how that you <laughs> You know, your, your boys, you, you should know, based on paraphrase, you should know better than that because your, your boys are, um, you know, you, you, you're you supposed to be a teacher from God. Don't you know better than that? Y'all go. And Jesus said, you know what? Let me tell you all this. Let me, let me help you understand it. You, you know, I know we're supposed to go through all this, but you, you know what? It What comes out what goes in is not as important as what comes out. <laughs> because <laughs> what comes out comes from the depth of your heart. Out of the wonders of the heart shall the mouth speak. Yeah. Jesus was a rule breaker. Because the people that got, the, the, the Jews had taken the law and they had made it God. Right. Wow. And we made our rules and regulations God. And we made our doctrine God. Well, if we had, this is a perfect season to return to God. Lent. In the midst, we, all, we missed Lent last year because the pandemic just had us so short <laughs> that we didn't even realize that we didn't realize we were. But Lent is an opportunity. So this, this morning, briefly, and I probably spoken more before what I was speaking after, briefly is what does the season of Lent mean to us? I, I've come to the conclusion that in my 20 years of pastor and 23 years of preaching, that people don't listen to what you preach. You know, because you know, you ought to know what your preachers preach if you're serious about learning. If it's just to make you feel good for a minute, you just got a spiritual high. Right. But I'm gonna be honest with you, I haven't always been saved, and every time I got high in the world, it didn't last long. That's right, man. That's why they call it a high. <laughs> it gets you there for a minute. But you can't get high off the word. I, I, it you to get, I don't need to get high off of the word. I need to be fed off the word. I need to eat off the word. Right, yeah. I need some nourishment because high would just get me up there. Y'all get me? Getting high would just get you up there excited for a minute. And I know people, they get, and Jesus talked about this too with the parable of the, sea, of the seed, of the soil. I know people, they get excited for the Lord the first time something happened. The weeds come up and choke it out. They got high, but they can't stay high. Right. You can't stay high. You got to stay fed. Which means you got to eat off the word, feed off the word, nourish the word. And as Bishop Darrell Starr says, people always use that excuse. I'm going to another church because I, I ain't getting fed. But the only people we know that can't feed themselves is a baby. So if you go out to another church because you ain't getting fed, that means you ain't open up your mouth. Because the only person, the only people we know that can't feed themselves is a baby. Because by the time you get two, you ought to be able to do a little something. You got to feed yourself with this word. Because mom and daddy can put it on the table. But if you don't eat it, it don't matter. You know, it don't matter. I mean, you know, how many, I used to just tell my kids, I don't want that kid. I said, we won't get nothing else. Because <laughs> I have done cook what I done cook. <laughs> and if you don't want that, you're going to have to go make sure you do something else. So I'm about to cook. I'm cooking this morning. You got a choice to eat or not. Right. If you don't eat and you go hungry, that's on you. All right. but, 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 but the spiritual chef is in the house. And I'm about to cook. I'm going to put it on the table. You got to eat it. If you don't eat, that's your fault. Because you got to work out your own soul side. Part of what it needs to be done is we got to stop babying for. Is that you got to work out your own soul salvation with tree and children. Because when you get before the Lord, you can't use me as no excuse. You can't say, Lord, I ain't nothing but the pastor. The pastor ain't preaching. He can say, no, 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 no. You got to work it out for yourself. I'm only responsible for me, and I'm only responsible for that I give it to you. Once I give it to you, 
like to share about me if they ain't listening to no them. <laughs> but this is a perfect season to get it right. Yeah. Because the question is this. I realized at turning 48 in summer, God let me see it, that I probably got more ahead behind me than I do ahead him. I'm conscious of that fact. I'm not afraid to die, but I realize that unless the Lord comes back. And I want to make sure that these years I have, the ones I have left, they mean something. They mean something to the kingdom. And Lord, I will do my best to lift up the kingdom. So when you call me home, I hear you say, welcome. Because I realize this place is not my home. I didn't come here to stay. I know we like, I know what it is, I know I like living, but I didn't come in this thing. One day when I come to the end of my journey, yeah. where we have life, the battle is over, and the victory is one I'll be carrying the staff and the cross of redemption. He understands your say one. Yeah. That's what people say. He understands. Yeah. And we got to tell people the truth. And the truth is that you've got to get it right with God. Yeah. And it's not by your works, it's by your faith. But if you have faith, works will follow. Yes, yes. We've been told too many godless men and, and, and wives came. We've been told too much foolishness in the church. The word is the word. Yes, yes. And we got to get back to the word. That's right. What a great season to get back to the word in the season of Lent. Last Wednesday was Wednesday. We didn't get a chance to do it. But you all have to remember one thing. All of these rituals are symbolic. Yeah. Right. Put the ashes on your forehead, not going to save you. That's right. It's just symbolic of yeah. we're giving ourselves to Christ. Amen. Even communion. If we don't start doing communion, but communion can't save you. Right. right. If you don't have a relationship with the Master. That's it. Because your life should be in remembrance of Him. That's yes. right. True. Your life, every morning you wake up. You should do it in remembrance of Christ. Communion is just a ritual that reminds you of it. Live is a time of preparation. It's 40 days. We exclude the Sundays because Sundays are always many resurrection days. Today is a day. We celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. It's to prepare our hearts for the Christ. It lasts 40 days because there were always a 40 40 or 400 motif in the Bible. 40 days, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites wandered for 400 years. Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. He was seen on earth 40 days, and on the 50th day after his resurrection, he was ascended there. There's something about a 40 day period, whether it's months or days or years, it's always a period of testing, trial, probation, chastisement, but not judgment. There's a difference. It ends with a point, a period of restoration, revival, or renewal. You gotta allow it yourself. To seek after Christ. Lent should be taken as an opportunity for us to grow closer to God. Think about if every year you were growing closer to God. The Lent, we, we commercial, we, <laughs> we've trivialized Lent, and you've heard me say this before, it, is, it makes me sick to my stomach when I see people at work or people I know, and they say, Ooh, I'm going to give up chocolate for me. I said, well, you need to give up that <laughs> I'm going to give up cookies. You need to give up lying. I'm going to give up sodas. You need to give up jealousy yeah. and hate. Yeah. Because the whole goal, as I've said before, is that you forget you give up something that you never intend to pick back up. Now you know you're gonna eat some chocolate on you know, Christmas on Easter Sunday morning. You, 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 you're not giving that up forever. Come on, let's keep it real. You, you know you're gonna drink you a Coca-Cola. 
You need to give up something that you don't intend to pick back up. Let it should cause you to die to self. That's what this journey is. Just as Jesus died on the cross and his father might be glorified and we get the gift of eternal life, just as Jesus died on the cross, we have to die you want to live, what a great paradox in the scripture. If you want to live, you got to die. Yeah, that's good. If you want to live, live in Christ, you got to die to yourself. Amen. Yeah. And that's what's wrong with the church. We got too many cells in the church. Wow. And when you got a bunch of cells in the church, you have a bunch of selfishness. Yes. Wow. That's good. When you have that, listen. It's natural. If, if you've not been changed and you about self, then self is going to gratify self. And self is going to look to look out for self. Well, that's called selfishness. Yeah. And that's why there's so much selfishness in the church from the pulpit to the pew. And not this group, but don't talk about the choir thing. Well, <laughs> 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 one of them. Quit the choir because they won't, won't the, the director make no lip sync. So maybe you can't sing. <laughs> Somebody come in here just singing for a job. Yeah. Or singing to get a check. But you got to know what God has called you to. Right. Yes. You know what? We say it, but you ought to be saying, Lord, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. Yeah. I don't have to be in the front. You like to call my name. I don't want to be in the middle. Yeah. Amen. That's a selfless spirit. Yeah. And that's what we need more of in the church. Selfless spirit instead of selfish spirit. Because when we have self in spirit, the devil said back to him, happy, happy, jolly, jolly. Because I got them fighting each other instead of looking to fight me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lent reminds us that we all are sinners saved by grace. There's nothing that you and I have done to earn this. Unlike our earthly accomplishments, I earn three degrees. I can take the credit, but I don't because it was nothing but for the grace of God. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, you and I have done nothing to deserve this. And you ought to live like you have done nothing to deserve this. You ought to be so grateful when you wake up every morning that you're just alive one more day. You ought to be thankful when you can put your feet on the ground in your house and it's warm. And you can go in your kitchen and you can get you a cup of coffee and drink it. And you ought to be thankful. I thought about this with all this cold snappers and all these people living outside the homeless in and, and Texas. And we, we, we complain about everything, but we ought to be grateful about all of this. In the scripture today, we see the importance of humility. When it comes to righteousness, we don't stand on our own righteousness. We don't have any. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves righteous before God. Yes. There's nothing. Matter of fact, Paul says we look like filthy rags when it comes to God. What puts us back in the right relationship with God is our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Calvary was all about. We need to be careful to always remember that we are saved by grace. Yes. And since God is not a respect of person, if God saved you by grace, he can save somebody else by grace. Amen. Amen. This is not the country club. <laughs> I love my fraternity, and I'm sure you love your fraternity and sorority, but this is not the fraternity or sorority. That's right. 
This is the ecclesia. Yeah. This is the church of the living God. Yeah. This is not our social club. This is where anybody who is, who, anybody who will, let them come. Yes. And we have a word for them. Yes. And we are just, a, we, you know what we are? We're just beggars trying to tell another beggar where they can get some bread. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the text starts off by saying, that to some who were confident in their own righteousness, they looked down on everyone else, Jesus told a parable. Jesus' parable was an extended metaphor. They always had additional meaning. He tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And this parable demonstrates what lit is and what lit is not. One man acknowledged there was there something wrong with me and I need God to help me. The other man basically says, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. And as we examine these two men, we get a clear picture of what Lent should be and what Lent should not be. All right. Jesus told the story of people who were caught in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Two men, and y'all will walk with me, two men went to the temple to pray. Pharisee on the left, tax collector on the right. One, the religious leader of the day, I'm almost through. The other, a despised tax collector. Right. Who likes the hours? <laughs> Not many people. Remember, Pharisees, the one on the left, was supposed to live good, clean lives. The tax collector, in terms of the people's mind, were people who swindled and intimidated others out of their hard-earned money. Both of them came to church. They went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, the religious one, the one who the people thought should be religious, stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers and evildoers and adulterers, even like that old tax collector standing over there. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Somebody ought to pat me on the back. <laughs> you can sum it up this way. God, I thank you that there's nothing wrong with me. I don't even know why he made me the temple and pray. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you should have just stayed in your home because it wasn't wrong with you. What you need? You didn't need God. Maybe he was right. Maybe he was a good citizen. Maybe he was a good religious leader. Maybe he obeyed the law. Maybe he lived an upright life. Maybe even in religious days, he did what he was supposed to do. He gave a tenth of his income to the church. And even he fasted twice a week. Really, there wasn't much wrong with him, right? He was a good man. Then Jesus focuses on the tax collector in the story. I'm coming back to this. I'm going to see. The opposite of the Pharisee. He had been stealing money from people his whole life. Lord. Ruining the lives of others when he could live it up. Because the tax collectors were notorious of collecting over what he was supposed to get. Right. That's why people hate them. Because right. they had the authority, the authority of the Roman Empire, but they were notorious if the, if, if, if the tax was 10 denarii, they could make 20, they collect 25. And as long as they turned into 10 to Rome, they kept the rest in their pocket. That's why the people hated him, because they know they were crooked. Yeah. He knew that his whole life had been a disaster. And that he deserved to go to hell when he died. The tax collector said that he even stood at a distance, which means he didn't even try to get close to where everybody else was. <laughs> he was so ashamed of himself. He beat his breast. And he said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. His prayer was the opposite of the Pharisees. Wasn't it? Maybe you can sum up his prayer this way. God, there's everything wrong with me. <laughs> I need you to help. Jesus goes on to say that the tax collector was the one forgiven by God, the sinful tax collector, and not the perfect Pharisee. Now, why would Jesus say that this perfect 
quote unquote perfect Pharisees were not forgiven. Why? This is why. Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Mm -hmm. And they who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. The Pharisee was proud, mm -hmm. looking down on others, mm -hmm. exalting himself. I'm so great. He drank his own Kool-Aid. He was the own star in his own premiere movie. The tax collector was humble, sorry for his sins. What was Jesus saying here? Jesus saying, did, you, did Jesus say you can earn forgiveness by being humble? Look at how humble the tax collector is, said God. The tax collector deserves to be forgiven because he's humble. But how does that work? Well, imagine that. Because a lot of people think that, but that's not even how it works. <laughs> if that's why God forgives you, then your salvation would be dependent upon you. I'm, I'm helping y'all understand me. I'm, I'm, I'm playing around with you a little bit, but this tax collector wasn't saved because he was humble. That means that our salvation would be dependent on our level of humility. Then you can never be sure if you're forgiven or not. Because you never know if you're humble enough to be forgiven enough. Okay. <laughs> Am I making sense? The truth of the matter is neither the Pharisee on the left or the tax collector on the right deserve to be forgiven. Just like you and I. The Pharisee didn't because he was conceited in self-righteousness, thought he was better than everybody else, thought he was perfect. The tax collector didn't deserve God's forgiveness because of the terrible life he led. No one deserved to be forgiven by God. Neither one of them. But remember I told you that God forgives us because of us, not because of us. But God forgives us purely out of God's mercy. Yes. And like the Mississippi Mass Choir sings, your grace and mercy yes. brought me through. Yes. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you, thank you. and praise you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through. Thank you for saving a wretch like me. To tell the world salvation is free. There were times when I just didn't do right. But you watched over me all day and night. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm, I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through just as the man in the doctor should die. Yeah. But grace and mercy said, oh no, oh no, oh no, we've already paid the price. I was once blind, but now, thank God, I see. Yes. It was grace, because grace and mercy came along and rescued me. Yes, it did. You see, as a result of God's undeserved love, God forgives people. Oh, yeah. God forgives people because Jesus Christ took away the sins of the world. Yeah. Can I finish? Yeah. And because of that sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, cleansing the world of all his sin, God offers forgiveness to all. Yeah. I don't care if you are forgetful. Yeah. <laughs> you may not ever forgive him. Right. You may always hold a grudge. But God forgives. Yeah. God always stands at the door and says, you can be forgiven. Yes, In this story, God offered forgiveness to both the Pharisee on the left and the tax collector on the right. But only the tax collector received God's forgiveness. Wow. Why? Because in the because the tax collector said, Lord, have mercy on me. Yes, 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 yes. God chooses to forgive only those who say, Lord, I'm not what I ought to be. But I thank you that you still love me. And it's able 
There's everything wrong with me. Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Those people recognize their sin and they recognize their need for God. They recognize their need for God's forgiveness. The reason why the tax collector, I mean, the reason why the Pharisee wasn't forgiven, he didn't need God. He had it all figured out. He had everything, he did everything right. But I'm so glad when I wake up every morning and I go to sleep all night, I say, Lord, have mercy on me. <laughs> Have mercy on me, Lord. I need you every hour. I need you every hour. Not because they're earning and by problem, because God shows unbelievable and serve love to all those who are humble and seek after God. The tax collector was seeking after God. He realized he didn't have it together. He was saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. Yes. That humble tax collector is the perfect picture of Lent. The proud Pharisee is the exact opposite. Uh -huh. I don't need to pray for 40 days. Everything, I'm already all right. I don't need to fast like the preacher tells me to because I'm already good. Yeah. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. So I must be right before God. All right. The question is, which one are you this morning? Uh -huh. Are you the tax collector on the right? <laughs> Or you a Pharisee on the left? Yeah. Which one will you choose to be this year? Uh, the Pharisee on the left or the tax collector on the right? Uh, do you plan to act extra religious? <laughs> Lit, <coughs> many people observe that way. They get extra religious, you know. They get a little bit more religion. I'm so glad I don't have religion. I have a relationship. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's not the point. It's not the point to become extra religious. The point is to use Lent to give up something that will help you grow closer to God. Lent is about an attitude of honesty and humility. And as we confess our sins to God, but Lent is also about an attitude of relief and joy. Knowing that our sins have been forgiven. That the Lord has wiped our slate clean and gives us an opportunity to then serve God in our life. Lent is a time of self-denial. It's a time of growing close to the Lord. Become a better disciple. Don't try to be a better church member. Become a better disciple. Yeah. This is what the Lord tells us in Matthew 16, 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Yes. I pray that you take these 40 days to become richer in the Lord than any time in the spiritual journey. I pray that you will seek to be more like God more than you ever have in your life. I pray that you will endure and prosper during the season of repentance, prayer, fasting, and reflection. And I pray that you would remember the sacrifice that was made by our ancestors who got us to this point, February the 21st, 2021, 221, 21. And say, Lord, I thank you. Yes. Thank you yes. for bringing me this far. Oh, yes. <laughs> when I look back <laughs> all of my life, we all look back with me. When I look back over my life, yes. Yes. there have been some good days. But I stand here on this the third Sunday of February 2021 in the midst of a pandemic on Black History Month to say, Lord, if it had not been for your grace and your mercy, where would I be this morning? Because there were times in my life that the burden was so hard to bear. And I felt like giving up. But I heard the word say, Be still. Uh, and know that I am God. Yes. I don't know about you, but my heart needs a tears of joy. Because when I think about the Lord, and how the Lord has kept me. Yes, Jobs have come, people have come and go, family members have died and gone. 
But the Lord has kept me. And you ought to be thankful. Not just today because it's Sunday. Every morning you wake up, you ought to tell the Lord thank you. Doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, because they've been cast this for every age. But you ought to tell the Lord thank you. You ought to tell the Lord thank you for being my help. Thank you for being my hope. Thank you for walking with me when I felt like I was all alone. Thank you for wiping my tears away. Thank you for being my soul in the middle of the night. All right. And as the Mississippi Mass Choir said, thank you for your grace. Hallelujah. Thank you. I will submit, I cry every time I hear this song. You know why? Because I don't know about you, but I've been through some stuff in these 47 and a half years. But I thank God he's kept me. Anybody thank God he's kept me? Anybody thank God he's kept me? Come on, somebody, thank God he's kept me.
Praise God. 